Time now in our worship service where we worship God through his proclaimed word. This morning we'll do that as we continue in our study in Romans. I feel like someone's preaching to me right back. It's kind of cool. <laughs> this morning, <laughs> we'll do that as we continue our study in Romans. So if you'll turn with me to chapter 5. We're again looking at, uh, we've been looking at Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, and we are calling this the exulting section. And I hope to finish it up this morning. I can tune things out really easy, but that one's going to be a little harder than normal. So this has filled up my heart with exuberant joy. I am just so full this morning. It's just kind of eclipsed everything that's been going on around me in 2020. I I pray when we're done, we're going to just be staring at this diamond and you're going to be lost in love, wonder, and praise looking at this glorious God. So what are we to exalt in? In verse 2, we saw the word of hope in the glory of God. We have a beautiful hope that the salvation will bring us safely to glory. And then in a rainy day outside and windy and all of that, we looked at word of rejoice and exalt in our tribulations. The tribulations because they're from God and they bring about perseverance. And per- perseverance brings proven character and proven character brings hope. And so these trials cause us to hope more in glory so that you don't put your hope here on this earth and try to make this paradise. So thank you, God, that you squeeze us so that we will hope in what is coming. And the way this hope will never disappoint is because the love of God has been shed abroad in my heart in Christ Jesus. And now this morning, we're going to do some more exalting, the third one. And this morning, he just says we exalt in God in verse 11, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Not hope of glory, not tribulations, just take everything away. We're just a people that exult in God. A reconciled God is what we exult in this morning. So if you'll look with me in verses 9 through 11. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God. Through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through, through whom now we have received the reconciliation. And so this morning, we exult in the hope of glory. We're going to see that just, I want to give some observations of that text that I just read. And it's really structured by three phrases. In verse 9, much more than. In verse 10, much more. And in verse 11, and not only this, which we heard back in verse 3. And so at the heart of these verses, and kind of holds this whole passage together, I'm going to call it the epicenter, is in verse 9, we shall be saved from the wrath of God, by his blood through his death. So Jesus died and we're gonna gonna be saved from the wrath of God because Jesus propitiated it on the cross. In verse 10, we shall be saved then on this last day as well by his life. And so his life and his death are the epicenter of why we'll be saved from wrath. And the way that this will come about is in uh, verse nine is that we've been justified. And we've been working through that in Romans 3 through 4, that Jesus has come and and he's done a work that now we can be made right with God. We can be declared not guilty and we can have peace with God. And then three times in these verses is the word reconciliation. (laughs) So if you've come this morning or you're listening online, this is about how you can be made right with God. This is how you can be reconciled. And he says this morning, you were an enemy of God. And so we were born enemies. And until we're reconciled, we're enemies of God and the wrath of God is upon us. And so there's this section is there's a way to become friends of God, 
to become reconciled with the God of this universe. May today be the end of your searching if you're trying to find how to be right with God. And then the glue that holds it all together is the work of Christ. We're told by his blood, his death, and his life. And in verse 11, I exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then the whole package, the whole passage is bracketed in verse 9 and 11 by the word now. You have it now, right? Now, there's no wrath, there's no condemnation, there's right now reconciliation with God. And so the whole argument that by being joined to Jesus Christ by faith, you're justified. And when you're justified, you get these three salvations. Your past, he says, you were justified. And so every one of you who are believers, your, your past is you were saved and you were brought to God and you were made right with God. You, you can say, I was saved. And then the other is I'm um, being saved in Romans 6 through 8 now that God's going to sanctify you. He's going to grow you. He's going to change you and conform you to the image of Jesus Christ. So you could say, I'm being saved. So I've been saved. And now the God of the universe is working in my life by grace to conform me to his image. So I'm being saved. And then in this verse, in the future, when you stand before God on judgment day, you're going to be saved for all of eternity, saved to sin no more. And that'll be Romans chapter eight. And so the three salvations, past, present, and future, are inseparably linked by being joined to Jesus Christ. That is the only way to ever be made right with God. And so the right now, the key and the reason for certainty of a future salvation. And so what you have right now, much more than, is you have a future with God forever. And to think some people are sleeping and golfing this morning. That's that's everything in three verses that we're going to look at. And so let's take it up. It's so good. One more observation. (laughs) All the verbs, five of them are in the passive voice. So every verb that we're going to look at this morning, it's all passive and it's called a divine passive. And that means something that is being done to you that it can only be done by God. God himself is doing all of these verbs to you. God's the active agent. It's all of grace. That's why we're going to exalt in God at the end of the passage because you're not doing anything. God does it all. And when we finish, you're just going to be like, I exalt in God. This is what he's done And this is why you can be so certain that on that last day when you stand before him in judgment, you're going to be brought safely into paradise. So that's what we're going to look at this morning. Just logic on fire. (laughs) So I want to pray one more time because what we're looking at this morning, one of the most common things I counsel in battle in my own fight of faith is what we learned earlier in chapters three and four is justification is a battle. And sometimes you begin looking at how you work and how you perform for your acceptance with God. And remember, he kept saying, you can't be a working one, you're a believing one. You look away from anything in you and you look only to the finished work of Christ. And that's a battle for every one of us to to stay in that justification and believe. But the other is judgment day. And many of you in in my counseling and in my own heart is you're aware of your your own sin and you're so aware of your shortcomings that you shrink back just a little bit. So when COVID comes to town, I'm more worried about dying than how to redeem the opportunity that God has given to us as a body to enter into this world more than ever now and show them that we got a hope past death. And this is our chance to shine. And so I pray that this morning, I'm I'm just, for each one of you, every one of your faces, I don't want you to be afraid when the doctor calls you and says, cancer, it's inoperable. It's malignant. 
you got a heart disease and you got six months to live. I don't want you going, oh no, am I going to be okay when I stand before God? And this morning, I'm going to show you how you can have that hope. And I'm going to show you that the, the wrath of God, he's going to sh- he's, he wants you to see on that last day, you're going to be the safest person on the face of the earth. And so I want confidence in the children of God. I think it was Spurgeon, he, he said that when Jesus said to the thief, today you'll be with me in paradise, is that he says that to every child of God right before you breathe your last breath. The good shepherd will come in the shadow of the valley and say, today you'll be with me in paradise. You're going to be safe. And so I want that to overtake us so that we exalt in our God. So let's pray. Father, I desire the exalting of every heart this morning. I want every one of us to just worship a reconciled God who was reconciled this day by the work of Christ and who is going to be reconciled on that last day in judgment because of Christ. Our salvation is past, present, and future. Our salvation is so secure. Oh God, your grace covered all of it. And I want us to live into the fullness of it. I want us to be an exalting people and this reconciled God. And I pray now with this logic of Paul through the Holy Spirit, God, that we would look at it and our hearts would end up at the the close of this service, exalting in you and in you alone. God, I thank you for this, and it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. Paul's going to use a very logical argument then to sweep us off our feet. And he's not just deducing for the sake of deducing, but he logics to show us all that we have in Christ Jesus. And his type of argument was a very common uh, rhetoric of the day. And it was you you would argue from the, the greater to the lesser. If the greater is true, how much more will the lesser be? If, if he did the heavier thing, how much easier to do the lighter thing is going to be the logic? And so here's your outline. Paul's going to show us three reasons why we can be sure of our future salvation. That's what he is running after this morning, our future salvation. In verse 9, we're going to look at an axiomatic truth. Verse 10, I'm going to take the argument and flush it out. And then in verse 11, we'll make our application this morning. So in verse 9, the axiom, much more than Having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. It's almost as if Paul now is assuming an antagonist, that the love of God, Christ died. Your sins are forgiven. We've been studying that. Well, how can we be sure? How can we be sure that I won't be condemned at the end of history at the great white throne of judgment? Is our salvation really a final one? Can I be absolutely certain? It's something you've got to be certain of. And so Paul's going to show us we will be saved from the wrath of God. On the great day of judgment, when God pours out his wrath against sin and evil, we will not be taken away by the flood of his wrath. Like in the days of Noah, when they were just were taken away in the flood. Much more than, much more than the heavy lifting, the hardest part of redemption He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How how will he not freely give you all things? He he sweat blood as he looked into the cup of atonement that he must drink. He did the hardest thing by going up on Calvary's tree. So again, the heavy lifting of redemption was done in Calvary, in Gethsemane. So therefore, much more than having now been justified by his blood. And we looked at that glorious truth of imputation, that God took our sins and he put them on Christ. Christ bore the wrath of God on that tree in our place. And he took the perfect righteousness of Christ and he put it to our account. So when God looks at us now, it's as if we have lived the life that Christ lived and you are declared justified before God through faith. And I don't miss the word now. Right now, you're as justified as you can ever be. You can't get more justified or less justified. Let that overtake you 
Right now, I sit here this morning justified by faith in the finished work of Christ alone. The last day verdict, then, of when you come and stand before Christ at judgment, forgiven, accepted, here's your reward. Enter into the joy of your master. And I want you to hear that. That is mine right now. That's mine now. And so get this. The last day verdict of justification, I have that right now. I have what I need when I stand before God in judgment this very day. There's no condemnation right now that will come at the end of history. Okay? There's no condemnation, he says, right now in Romans 8.1. There won't be any on the last day either. You have no condemnation as you sit here this morning, child of God, and you will not have any on the last day. You got to see the connection and quit fearing, oh wait, there might be some there for me on the last day. There's none. He drained every last bit of it. There's no, there's no more condemnation. It's all gone. There won't be any on the last day either. It's been dealt with in Romans 3. All the condemnation for past Present and future sins was poured out on the Son of God. Shake the cup. There's not another drop left for the last day. I'm justified right now. I'm accepted by God right now. I'm forgiven for every last sin right now. I stand in the righteousness of Jesus Christ right now. So much more then. We shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. It's a future tense. So on the day when God releases his wrath, do you remember back in Romans 2, 5? You're storing up wrath for the day of wrath. It's growing every day. And the patience of God is holding it back. And then there's a day he's decreed when that wrath is going to come forth. And on the day of judgment, all will appear on that day and the wrath will be unleashed. And you see that we saw last week, you're helpless, you're ungodly, and you're a sinner, and you're an enemy. We looked at Isaiah 6, and you saw the holiness of this God with all of that sin. What am I going to do on the last day? What if I don't get through that? What if I'm swept away in it for all of eternity? How can I be certain of escape and deliverance from that day? Who's going to rescue us from it? Who or what are you counting on this morning? I pray you aren't holding to some little good deeds or church attendance. That'll be washed away as quick as everybody was in the day of Noah. I pray no one sits here resting in that. What is the answer? Only God can rescue you from God. Only God can rescue you from that wrath of God on the last day. Five verbs. (coughs) Having been justified. Be saved. We're reconciled, been reconciled, and be saved all in the passive voice. God is the only one who can do this. And how does he do it? How's he going to do it? Through him, Jesus Christ. That is the only way that you will ever be delivered from this day. These passages glorify Christ. There are six references in Romans 5, 6 through 8, Christ died. 5, 9, having been justified by his blood. 5, 10, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. We shall be saved by his life. Verse 11, we exult in God, how? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's so Christocentric and Christ honoring of how God will do this. So you have to see that the way that God saves us from his wrath By Jesus Christ. All the promises of God are yea and amen in Christ. All the blessings in the heavenly places are in Christ Jesus. That one of my favorite hymns, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Christ is the fountain of every blessing. This is how God will bring about all these blessings. And the the, the one Christ Jesus is our hope. In Christ, I have everything. And that's why I'd rather have Jesus than anything. I pray he's a pearl of great price to you this morning. He gives me the reconciliation and he will deliver me from the wrath to come. So let me give you a summary of verse 9. You're without strength. 
You're ungodly, you're sinners. In verse 10, you're an enemy. God is righteous and infinitely holy. We are justified and we're declared righteous because we're wrapped in the righteousness of Christ. Our judgment, in a sense, has taken place here. It's a court decision and the the judge of the universe with infinite knowledge and knows your exact life. He says, you're just. I declare you just and you've passed from death to life and we shall never come under condemnation because of the one who already has. There's one who's already been condemned, Christ Jesus, it is he. And when God justifies a man, hear this, it's his final pronouncement. Okay? There's not another one. The final pronouncement, I declare you justified for all of eternity. It's forever. It's done. Not guilty. You can never, ever come back under the title of what we spent a year on, guilty. All of us come into the world guilty. You're guilty, guilty. And now through Jesus Christ, you are declared not guilty, and there's no way to ever come out from under that ever again. Smile. Some of you look like you're sucking on lemons. Amen? (laughs) When God justifies a man, it's your final pronouncement. Not guilty. You can never come back under that title. No longer uncertainty. There's no purgatory. There's no priests. There's no works. God makes a pronouncement forgiven and righteous. And now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's the best news you could ever hear. So let's look at this verse again. And I want you to get this because there's so much freedom here. Much more than. If God justifies us by Christ Jesus right now, how much more shall you be saved from the wrath of God on the last day? And I know I'm using this phrase too many times. The heavy lifting is done. God did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How is he not going to freely give you everything that you need? I want you to hear this. This is not um, to take lightly. Judgment day is going to be easy for God. (laughs) To not put wrath upon you, he already put it on his own son. And right now there's no wrath on you, nor shall there ever be. Even on the day when you appear before Christ on judgment day, my brethren, the hard part was done at Calvary. It's going to be easy to bring you through judgment on the last day. Isn't that amazing? I love the argument. The hard part's done. Getting you through judgment is just like a baby grabbing a finger. It's natural. It's easy now. It doesn't cost. Look at the cross. You need not fear the day that has been appointed for every soul. You have a day that you will die. It's been appointed. You need not fear it. When you appear before the judgment seat of Christ, child of God, no more fearing that day. The much more is so much easier for your Passover day. And the wrath of God will just pass over you because it did not pass over the Lamb of God that hung on Calvary's tree. You pass over. Such sanctified logic. Let it take your heart. That can be yours by faith in Christ this morning. If you don't have that, that wrath will not pass you over, but it will be upon you for all of eternity. And so I want you to see your greatest need here this morning is what I'm preaching on. Please, let Christ take that, your Passover lamb, and believe upon him and be saved. That's your axiom Our second point now is I want to turn to verse 10 now and look at this more sanctified argument. Paul's just getting started. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And so the greater is while we were enemies. We not only disliked God, 
We were opposed to God, that we would destroy him if we could. There was great hostility in our hearts. It was like when you meet an enemy in war, it's kill or be killed. That was us and God. And we were absolutely set against him. And John Murray in Redemption Accomplished and Applied, the book he wrote, he draws it out. He says that there was enmity with both parties. Us from God because of our sin and God from us because of his holiness and his justice. And there's this eternal enmity between the two of us that would have never ended. It would be an eternal war unless God had done these five passive verbs where he came in the world to fix this problem. Listen to James 4. You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Loving this world is hostility toward God. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Romans 8, 7, the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God. Colossians 1, and although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds. We were his enemy. We loved the world. We wanted it our own way. We wanted God gone. We wanted him out of our memories. We wanted him to suppress him. He doesn't exist. That's this whole world. And while we were enemies, God did something. We were reconciled to God through the death of his son. So don't move by this quickly. We were reconciled to God. And that really should take your breath away, truly. You were reconciled to God. What a phrase, the whole Bible's in it. Hark the herald. God and sinners reconciled. When you consider the enmity that existed, the enmity in our hearts was so deep, it could never, it could never get sucked out or done away. And the enmity in God's heart was so deep because of his holiness and justice. It was an enmity that was never going to be fixed. And it's the greatest, think of the greatest enmity you've ever known. This was the greatest one ever. And, and reconciled. It's not a simple word. It cost God his own son to be able to say it. But I think what makes it so amazing to me is how he did it. He took the initiative. So we're celebrating. He entered into the world. He did all the work. God the Father gave his most treasured one to reconcile to those who hated him. To reconcile those who would pierce him through and crucify him because the enmity was that great. They hated him so bad they had to kill him. God surely knows what it's like to love those who hate him. And we all know that reconciliation is a two-way street. Both parties have to work back together. And that is why Paul said, be at peace with all men as much as possible with you, because sometimes you can't do it because both parties have to work together. So reconciliation is a two-way street, except here. Everything is done by God. God did everything necessary by the death of his son. The death that could drain the enmity from both parties. And as he hangs on a cross and you look at God dying in your place, all the enmity that I had in my heart was just like a, a poison from a, from a viper just sucked out of all my veins. Just gone. And all of a sudden, now I love him. And all the enmity that God had was poured out on his son every last drop, so that if you looked in the heart of God this morning, there's not even a drop. It's, it's the best reconciliation, most thorough, perfect that could ever take place. There's a way to be reconciled with God. And we can go from the title of enemy to friend, to son, to beloved one whose name is written on the palm of his hand to the apple of his eye. It's amazing grace, how sweet the sound. 
So catch the argument. If God did all that when we were enemies, when we were haters of God, he loved us. And he gave us his son so he could reconcile us to himself. He brought us near to his very heart and adopted us so we could be joined with Christ. Certainly, he will save us from his wrath now that I'm a beloved child. If he did that when I was an enemy, what's he going to do for me on the last day when I'm his son or daughter? So good. If he did that while I was an enemy, what, what will he do with a reconciled friend? What will he do for me on the last day of judgment? Charles Hodge said, if God died for his enemies, how much more he shall surely save his friends. Isn't that great logic? That gives me confidence to enter in on the last day. I'm your friend. You died when I hated you. Take that in. We sh- and then he says, we shall be saved by his life. Did that catch anybody funny? I expected the, this whole passage is you were saved by his death. You were saved by his death. And all of a sudden, you'll be saved by his, his life. I'm reconciled by his death and I'm saved by his life. I expected death there. So how then are we saved by Jesus' life? And what we've seen in Romans is through justification his perfect life that he lived, he fulfilled the law, that's put to your account and you're justified. You're saved by his life. So for me, he lived and for me, he died. But there's something more to the text that I've been wrestling with this week. You shall be saved by his life, but catch it, it's something future. So I don't think he's talking about justification. When shall we be saved in the future? He says, by his life. So here's where it is. I'm thinking. Union with Christ. His death was ours. And his burial was ours. As we're going to see in Romans 6. And so his resurrection was ours. And right now you're seated at the right hand of the Father is ours. It says that right now you're seated in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So how do I know I will make it to the very end of glorification and to this new heavens and the new earth? And the answer is Jesus is already in heaven interceding on my behalf so that I might make it to the end. His life right now, what is he doing right now? He's praying for his bride. Remember when he said, Peter, Satan has asked permission to sift you like wheat? And why did Peter not fall? Because I prayed for you. And Peter stood because the Lord of the universe is praying for him. Christ's life right now, two nows, is interceding on your behalf. You know why I'm still standing in COVID 2020? (laughs) Christ prayed for me because I would have fallen a long time ago. And the reason I'm so confident of my future is his life. That is your security and your safety. Hear this, you can't be lost. Christ would have to quit living at the throne of the Father, interceding with his life right now for you to be lost. We are as secure as Christ's life, whose name in 1 John 1 is the eternal life. So the one who died for us when we were enemies is now the one who lives for us as friends. It says he's not ashamed to call us brethren. And he is right now interceding on your behalf that you don't fall. The one in heaven in complete victory with all authority who loved me and gave himself for me is interceding right now on my behalf. He will bring you all the way home. What is he called? The good shepherd. And what does he do at the end of that Psalm 23? He takes his sheep and he says, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. He's going to bring his sheep to the barn called heaven, paradise, where you're going to dwell forever. Where I am, he says, you shall be also. I go and prepare a place for you. The now of salvation guarantees the more. Much more, we shall be saved by his life. The hard part was his death. 
much more by his life as he prays and intercedes on your behalf. O oh God, shed this abroad in our hearts so that we might be overwhelmed with the love of God in Christ Jesus. You excited? That's, now you get the application. That has me lit up, and I haven't even got to the good part. I'm telling you, brother. <laughs> Acts, man, I need you sitting up front more often. You kind of get my blood boiling. Um, <laughs> I got an axiom and an argument, and now we'll close out with our application in verse 11. And not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. So not only this, what? You mean there's more? There has been, this has been the most amazing section, Romans 5, 1 through 11. And now he finishes it up and he goes, and not only this, these 10 verses of pure paradise and heaven that we've looked at. As I look at the future and all that he will do, the coming attractions, there's more. The best part of my salvation is who I'm reconciled to. The sweetest reconciliations I've ever had are when I'm reconciled to sweet people who I treasure. And I just want you to consider right now who you're reconciled to. That is what makes this heaven on earth summum bonum. I can exult in God right now this morning. In light of my present justification, in light of what's coming in the future, I'm going to be saved from the wrath of God and have eternal glory. I can exult right now, this morning, no matter what's going on around me. Right now in God, I can exult. The whole world can change. America can, can turn crazy. <laughs> can have a pandemic. The church can have all kinds of restrictions. Right now in God, I can exalt. That's been your test for 2020. Can you sit here this morning and exalt in this God? Because you're reconciled to him. If something's bigger than that and it's taken away your joy and your hope, you don't get it. Let it all fall away this morning. Exalt in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the call. Can you exalt in the giver more than the gifts? Because many gifts are gone. and Some of you lost some sweet gifts, like a wife and a son. Many of them are gone and things have changed. But the giver is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he loved me while I was a sinner. And he died for me when I was an enemy. And he reconciled me to himself. And he will save me from the wrath that is to come. And right now this morning I'm reconciled. And so I exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. I have a reconciled relationship with God. I exult in Him. For from Him, through Him, and to Him are all things. To Him be the glory forever. Amen. And this peace with God will not be interrupted on Judgment Day. Not one, not one iota. It is guaranteed by the life and the death of Jesus Christ. So I exult. I'm going to read a quote by John Murray. And John Murray was a Presbyterian, and they were known to be a little sterile. You know? But I want you to hear this Presbyterian exulting in God. <laughs> John Murray says, Glorying knows no restraint, and it cannot be too exaggerated when it is in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It is not only that God is the object of this glorying. It is not only that he's the ground of it. It is in union and fellowship with him as our own God that that glorying is conducted. Our feet should never touch the ground again. <laughs> we exult in God through Christ. 
who reconciled me, who loves me, cares for me, communes with me, supports me, strengthens me, sustains me. He's my shepherd. I'm the sheep of his hand. He will bring me through judgment, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever through our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to close and just read a couple verses of what I think this could look like. Uh, Nate preached on this a while back, Habakkuk 3.17. I think this is a picture of what can happen. Though the fig tree should not blossom, and there be no fruit on the vines, though the yield of the olive should fail, and the fields produce no food, Though the flock should be cut off from the fold and there be no cattle in the stalls, everything's broken, dead, and taken away. Yet I will exult in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. Psalm 73, 25, Whom have I have in heaven but thee? Besides thee I desire nothing on earth. Psalm 63, 3, because thy loving kindness is better than life, my lips will praise thee. And Psalm 84, 10, a day in thy courts is better than a thousand outside. Psalm 27, 4, one thing I've asked from the Lord that I shall seek, that I might dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life and to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. And Luke 1, 46, as we enter into the Advent season, Mary said, my soul exalts the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior. As we look over the last year, is that what's causing you this morning to exalt in God? In Acts 2.46, day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved because of the contagious spirit of those who were exalting in God because of this salvation. And Paul said he had the privilege of preaching the marvelous riches of Christ Jesus. That's been my heart in Romans 5, 1 through 11. I'm just marveling at what God has done for us in Christ Jesus. Come, let us exalt our God together. Let's pray. Father, my heart is full with a good thing. And I thank you that you did do the heavy lifting at Calvary. I thank you now. The easier thing will be to bring me through judgment on the last day. I thank you that right now I stand reconciled to you. Thank you that hell itself can't separate it. Thank you that that is the one thing that matters. And that is what we fix our eyes on. And as a body, we rejoice and we praise and we worship our God. I don't exalt in the things you give me. I just exalt in you. So whether you give me abundance or you give me nothing, God, I exalt because you have given me all things in Christ Jesus. I exult in you, a reconciled God, who I should have been at eternal enmity forever. But you took the first steps and you brought about this reconciliation. Oh God, we thank you for the gift of this indescribable gift of Christ Jesus. God, prepare us to celebrate him coming into the world and dispelling the darkness. And we just lift high the cross of Christ in that beautiful name. And it's in his precious name that we do pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.